Good evening, church family. It is great to be here and so great to see everyone out on this beautiful Sunday evening. So very thankful for the presence of all. And uh, we are, are going to have just a few announcements and then we will get into our evening worship service. Want to uh, Don't have any new announcements, just want to kind of remind you of everything that, that Brother Jesse went over this morning. I want to encourage you to continue to pray for our president, our nation, and our leaders. Uh, there are many, many sick that we want to keep in our prayers. We want to keep Marsha Jeffers in our prayer. Continue to remember Brother Larry Jones, Levi Abbott, Joni Gary. Uh, continue to remember Sister Julie in your prayers. Uh, Tanya Sutherland, uh, she was able to be with us this morning, but do keep uh, her in your prayers. Lloyd Wright, Mackenzie Jones, Patty Cowan, Rachel Reed. Uh, my mom, Linda Payton, uh, Walter Stansel. Please continue to remember him. We had a special prayer for him this morning. Uh, he is not doing well, but do please keep him uh, in your prayers. And we also mentioned this morning, Brother Lee Holloway was homesick and Daniel was uh, sick, but Daniel was feeling better and able to be with us tonight. But do continue to remember, remember Brother Lee as he is unable to be with us. Also remember Sister Ann, she fell and hurt her leg, and so please keep her in your prayers. And also remember Colt Moore uh, is scheduled to have brain surgery tomorrow, so we want to remember Colt in our prayers. I want to say uh, congratulations to our 2021 graduates, Latia Barber and Tristan England. There's going to be a celebration for them next Sunday following the morning worship services. There'll be a fellowship meal, and then uh, the congregation will honor those graduates at that fellowship meal and want to make sure that we are able to be here if possible. And then there's going to be an evening or afternoon worship service at 2 p.m. instead of 5 p.m. So let's Let's remember that. I, I do regret that I will not be able to be here next Sunday. Uh, I will be speaking at a Victory Sunday for the East Ridge Church of Christ next Sunday. And so please pray for us as we travel there. I will certainly miss you, but I know that uh, you will be uh, definitely in good hands. I want to remind you, if, uh, if you will, that the Tuesday Bible class will resume this upcoming Tuesday. And we did finish the book of uh, the book of Hebrews finally, and we are going to dive into the book of Proverbs. And so, if you would like to be a part of that study this coming Tuesday, we will begin that study of the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> Brother Wayne said that he had plenty of dogwood and redwood uh, bush bush trees. If you would like to have some of those, then please be sure to see him. Be sure and check the bulletin board also for area gospel meetings. If you can go out and support those sister congregations, I know that they would be happy to see your smiling face and your support would be greatly appreciated. Our opening prayer at the appropriate time is going to be led by Brother Randy Overby, closing prayer, Brother Gary Murray, and then Brother JL is going to lead us in our singing. And so Without any further announcements, we're going to turn it over to Brother J.L., and he's going to encourage us as we lift our voices and we sing praises to our Heavenly Father. Let me say good evening to everyone. I want to thank David for those announcements that he made. We pray that, hope that everyone heard, understood, and if there's something you can do, we pray that you will provide. Uh, our first selection this morning will be more about Jesus. We sang verse 1, 2, and 4. And after we sang yeah, 1, 2, and 4, more about Jesus. More about Jesus, what I know. More of his grace to others show. More of his saving glorious More of his love to die for me. Thank you. 
Next to be what a friend we have in Jesus. We sing verses one, two, and three, and after we sing this song, uh, our prayer will be presented to us. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our Heavenly Father, we're thankful once again for this Lord's Day, this opportunity that you have given us to be here once again. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for the sunshine you've given us today. Heavenly Father, we know all things come from thee. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the church here, for what it means in this community and what it means here in Lafayette. And Father, we're just thankful for the church throughout the world, Heavenly Father. And Father, we're thankful for your son that was willing to die upon the cross for our sins so we could have eternal life with these. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our leaders that we have here. We're thankful for our elders as they lead us and guide us. We just ask, Heavenly Father, that you give these men strength and the wisdom to keep carrying on having the truth being taught here, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we are mindful of our list that we have, the sick that's been mentioned here tonight. Heavenly Father, we just ask you to be with them and help them, and may they gain their health back and be out with us once again, Heavenly Father. We ask, Heavenly Father, you be with those that have lost loved ones, help them, comfort them. Heavenly Father, we are thinking of this country at this time, Heavenly Father, that we know the country is heading in the wrong direction, Heavenly Father. We just ask that the leaders of this country look to thee for the answer to run this country in the right way, Heavenly Father. And Heavenly Father, we are reminded of our men and women that serve in the, the uh, forces that 
or throughout the world, throughout the country, and the Father, that you be with these men and women. May they get to come home and be home with their families once again, and the Father. And the Father, we just ask now as we go on through this hour, that we go through this worship service, that everything we do will be pleasing to thee. And forgive us all of our sins, and just in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you, brother, for that prayer. May God bless it continuously. Our next song will be Mansion Over the Hilltop. After we sing this song, uh, they will come before us and we will sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Let's stand up on this one. 1, 2, and 3. Mansion Over the Hilltop. I'm satisfied with just a little. Good evening. It is great to be here, and as always, it's so great to, to see everyone out. Couldn't think of a, a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks at the Lafayette Church of Christ, and we are just so very thankful for the presence of everyone uh, who is here uh, this evening. You know, so, sometimes in life we use phrases, and, and when they're used, we really all know what they mean, what they're talking about. For example, have you ever heard someone speak of an individual and say, that is my right-hand man? You ever heard that? I've said it before about several individuals. What do people mean when they say that? They're just saying that that individual is a person that, that they can depend on. When they are not able to, to carry on and when they are not able to do what is needed to be done, then they can depend upon that person to carry forward. Now, does that mean that a left-handed person is not important? No. It's just a cliche. It's just a, a phrase that we have come up with. And in how people came to it, I, I'm not certain. I, I just know what it means. I think it's interesting that when you look to the Bible that the phrase right hand appears there more times than you can begin to imagine. In fact, you know I love word studies. Brother Ken, I believe it was, asked me, how do you come up with your sermons? And a lot of times when I'm doing daily Bible reading, I'll read a verse and it might have a word, just a simple word 
or it might have a phrase and that phrase just jumps off the page at me and many times what I do is I turn it into a personal Bible study and it means so much that I'm, I'm just encouraged to share it with my brothers and sisters in Christ. But, but a lot of times you'll see different words. The word or the phrase right hand in and of itself is found some 388 times in the Bible. And many times when the phrase right hand appears, it's literally referring to our physical right hand. And when you see the phrase right hand, it has a number of different meanings. For example, sometimes when you see the right hand, it has reference to blessing. For example, in Genesis chapter 48 and verse 14, but Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on the head of Ephraim. What is Israel about to do, or Jacob at this time? He is about to bless Ephraim. And so what does he do? He reaches out his right hand. Does that mean the left hand was not important? No. It's just something that they did. It was a representation of blessing. But then again, as you and I read and study the Bible, we see that phrase right hand. Sometimes it just refers to a welcome. I love the passage in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9 where the Bible says, recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were, repu who were reputed, to, who were recognized as being the pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Now, what does that mean? It's just simply referring to the very fact that they welcomed them. And so sometimes when you see that phrase right hand, it refers to a welcome, a welcome of fellowship, a welcome to be able to work in the kingdom of God. And then in the third place, sometimes the word right hand or the phrase right hand is just talking about direction. Like in Psalm 142 and verse 4, where David would say, look and see there is no one at my right hand. David is literally, when I read that passage, pointing to his right hand and saying, no one is there. Incidentally, in the next passage, he would say, there's no one at my left hand. There's no one around me. So sometimes when we see that phrase right hand it's referring to direction and we could spend the rest of the night talking about different things that the phrase right hand refers to but what about when we see the right hand of God in the Bible what does that refer to I have to understand that it can't refer to physical appendages because the Bible describes God as a what a spirit. John 4 and verse 24. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when the Bible speaks of God as having a right hand or the Bible speaks of God as having other appendages, body appendages, he does not have physical appendages. And so I have to ask myself, what, what does it mean? And I have to come to the conclusion there has to be a deeper meaning than just the physical. And so in our time together tonight, I want you to think about the meaning of the right hand of God. When you and I see that phrase in the Bible, whether it be in the Old Testament or whether it be in the New, what does it represent? I want to suggest first of all unto you, it represents position. When you think about position, there are a lot of positions in this life that we might think of as being exalted positions or high positions. But brothers and sisters in Christ, when the Bible speaks of the right hand of God, there is no position that is greater than He is. And you can see that in so many passages of Scripture. I just want to bring a few to your attention. For example, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, where is Jesus right now? Where is He? The Bible teaches us, if you then were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting, where? At the right hand of God. Why is it that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God? Because there is no greater position of exaltation known to man. The greatest thing that you and I can ever attain to in this life is to be like Jesus Christ so that you and I can be where He is today. And so when you think about Jesus Christ being at the right hand of God, brothers and sisters, that's simply pointing out the fact that he is in a position of exaltation. For example, in Psalm 89 and verse 13, you have a mighty arm, strong is your hand, and look at that next phrase, high, and then oh, there's our word, 
your right hand. I want you to look at that word high. It comes from a Hebrew word, which literally means exalted. And so when God is trying to let you and I know about an exalted position, the greatest position that has ever been known to man, what does He use? He uses the right hand of God. And so it is a position of exaltation. I think you can see it most clearly in Acts chapter 2 and verse 33 where the Bible, after Peter had described Jesus Christ and had told them that they were guilty of murdering Him, he said, therefore being exalted to the what? To the right hand of God. So when you and I see that word, right hand of God, what is it talking about? It's talking about God's position. He is in a position of exaltation. There is no position greater than Him in the world. And I know a lot of times people think about individuals who are in great positions today and, and how high up they are. But brothers and sisters in Christ, every individual will answer to the Almighty God. He is the Creator. He is the Sustainer. He is Sovereign. And there is no one who is above Him. And He's our God. That's the God you and I serve. A God that is exalted to the highest position ever known to man. But when you see the right hand of God, there's a second thing that comes to my mind. I like to think of power. And again, when you think of power just like position, there's a lot of power in this world today. A lot of individuals who claim to have power. But brothers and sisters in Christ, again, there is no power as great as the power of of God Almighty. And when God wants to describe His power to you and to me, guess what He uses? He uses that phrase, the right hand of God. Again, in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 6, your right hand, there it is. And again, He's going to use His right reference, His right hand again twice in this verse. But look at what's right in between. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in what? In power. O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. In other words, there is no power that can stand against God. You know when you read this passage of Scripture that what Moses is doing is he's referring back to those Egyptians. And you remember the great power of the Egyptians. I mean, they ruled over God's people for over 400 years. But even though they had that great, that tremendous ruling power, who was in charge all along? Whose power was greater all along? God's was. And brothers and sisters, that's the way it is today. There will never come a time when there will be an individual or even a group of individuals whose power will become greater than the God that you and I serve today. He is the most powerful being. Like in Psalm chapter 63 and verse 8, my soul follows close behind you. Why? Why would David say, I follow God? And I don't just follow God, but I follow close. In other words, I cling to Him. It reminds me of when I was little and my dad started me out hunting and I was scared of the dark and he would take off through the woods like nothing was wrong and he wasn't afraid of anything. And folks, I never missed a step. A lot of times I was right on his heels and I would clip the back of his boot. I followed close behind. And David says, I follow close behind. Why, David? Because your right hand upholds me. There's power in the right hand of God. Do you and I follow close behind God? Because of the great power that He gives to you and me? Oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, when I think about the right hand of God, and I think about that position, and I think about that power, and then I look at Pastor Scripture like Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, and I learn that that power that great power that cannot be defeated, that great power that rules the world, dwells in you and me. Oh, what strength I gain from that. Oh, what strength we all should gain from that principle. But in the third place, when I think about the right hand of God, I don't only think about His position and His power. I like to think about His presence. Isn't it great to know that you're never alone in this life? You're not. You are. It doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter where you go. Even when you're riding down the road and there's no one in the car but you, are you ever alone? No. You've got the presence of God in your life. Jesus has promised, I will, He promised the disciples, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Are, are you His disciple? Certainly you are. 
And so you've got the promise He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He'll always be with us in this life that we live. And if there's ever been a passage of Scripture or a point or a thought in the Bible that suggests the continual presence of God, it is His right hand. I'm glad to know that God is with me. But when I understand the right hand of God, and I understand its position, I understand the tremendous power that is found within the right hand of God, it really causes me to dig deep in the fact that God's presence is with me. In the book of Psalm chapter 73 and verse 23, the psalmist would say, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. How do I know that? You hold me by your right hand. You hold me by your right hand. There have been many times in life when I would take the hands of an individual simply because of the fact that I was afraid or because of the fact that I was going to be alone or I felt as if I was going to be alone. I won't ever forget the last time that, that, um, that I had a surgery. I, I had a double hernia surgery. And when I went into that, that uh, surgery room, I, I must admit I was just a little bit frightened. And I'm just a human being just like anyone. And I won't ever forget when that nurse said, Mr. Payton, we're going to give you a shot that's going to make you go to sleep. I clenched that lady's hand. I didn't know who she was. I just wanted to feel that hand before I drifted off to sleep. You just understand that every time that you drift off to sleep, that you've got God by the hand. That'll give you comfort, won't it? Especially when you recognize His great power that's with you all the time. God's power is strong. And we understand His power is strong. And we understand that His presence is with us continually. There's never a time in this life when we are alone. Brothers and sisters, that, that should give us strength and comfort. I love Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Fear not. In other words, don't be afraid. Why? I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand what's the meaning here why is it that isaiah can say to these people you don't be afraid you don't be dismayed you don't be overcome with fear because god's right hand is with you at all times and you know that's something that you and i can take comfort in brethren we can understand that we don't have to fear anything we don't ever have to be dismayed or distraught in this life because the right hand of god his continual presence is always with us and it will never leave us. As we continue to think about the right hand of God, it's more than just position. It's more than just power and presence. I like to think of the word provision. Isn't it great to know that you're going to be provided for? It is. You think about little children. Now, we get this question all the time in the Payton house. What are we eating for supper? What are we eating for lunch? What are we eating for breakfast? If I heard that one time the past two weeks, I heard it a thousand times. Right? But you know, each time that that question was asked, they, there was no fear. There was no dread. They didn't work. They weren't asking that question thinking that we are going to have to miss a meal because folks, if you're with me, you're not going to miss any meals. I'm going to try to out-eat you when we go somewhere. I promise I will. I like deep. You can probably tell. But the idea is that they knew that we were going to provide for them. And that's the same attitude that we need to have when it comes to God. I love the psalmist in Psalm chapter 37 where David would say, I've been young and I've been old and I've never seen the righteous. Who are you? You're the righteous. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging for bread. As God's people, when was the last time that you were completely and utterly forsaken by God? Anyone want to raise their hand and talk about it? When was the last time that you literally had to beg for food? That you didn't have anything in the pantry? It may not necessarily be what you want. But there's always food. Right? Where does it come from? Well, Mama goes to the store and she buys it. I understand that. Well, where does it come from? Well, daddy works and mama works and the money that they 
And they, I understand that, but we're still not getting to the point of where it comes from. Everything that we have in this life, where does it come from? Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is a gift from God. He provides for us. And I love the fact that the Bible teaches us that it is by His right hand that He has provided for us, that He is providing for us now, and that He will always provide for us. There won't ever come a time when He will stop providing for God's people. Think of the words of the psalmist. I love Psalm 16 and verse 11. You will show me the path of life in your presence. Watch it. Is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures. How long? Do you see the word? Do you see the word that the psalmist was inspired to use? Forevermore. There will never come a time when God will not give us what we need in this life. Now understand that I said there will never come a time when He will not give us what we need. He may not give you what you want, but He'll always give us what we need, brethren. He's going to provide for us. I mean, you, you just think about a, a father. A, a father, a, a good father is going to do everything within his power to provide for his children. A good mother is going to do everything within her power to provide for her children. And brothers and sisters, if we as human beings have that attitude, how much more our Heavenly Father who has created this world and who has been providing for you and me since the day that we took our very first breath. Psalm 139 beginning in verse 8, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies. At your, there's our phrase, your right hand will save me. The Lord will be perfect that will make perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hand. I can count on God providing for me, even though as David would say, when I'm walking in a mist of trouble, when there are times in my life when I don't know which way to turn, and I'm distraught, and I don't know what decision to make, you know who is standing there at all times providing for me? In taking care of me, who is it? It's God, brothers and sisters. And so when you think about God, He's going to provide for us. He's going to always give the, us the things that we need. In the fifth place, as I think about the right hand of God, I'm reminded of His protection. Again, isn't it great to know that you are protected in that feeling of protection and my mind goes back to a little child when, when a little child is in the presence of its mother or or its father what happens well they don't have a care or worry in the world but let that mother or father step out of the sea and they look around and they begin to see that mother and father is not there what will they begin to do they'll begin to cry they'll begin to tear up and they'll begin to, to look for mom and they'll begin to look for dad. Why? Because mom and dad serve as a protection symbol to them. And likewise, brothers and sisters, when you and I think about protection, the ultimate protection comes from God Almighty. And, and again, when you think about God's protection, it goes right back to His right hand. In the book of Psalm chapter 44 and verse 3, 4, they did not gain possession of the land by their own sword, nor did their own arm save them. How then were they saved? How then did they gain the protection or the possession of the land? But it was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your countenance because you favored them. When you think about the uh, protection that, that we have in this life, who is it that protected these people from their enemies? It was God Almighty. And who is it that protects you and I from our enemies? Number one enemy, Satan himself. Is it not God? Folks, he's not stopped protecting people. A lot of times we read in the Old Testament, we'll see how God protected his people. And then we'll come to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul will talk about how God protected him. And we'll say, oh, well, that was in the age of miracles. And so God is not protecting us anymore. You remember that word baloney this morning? Write it down again. Because that's not the teaching of the Bible. 
Folks, God is not stopped. I mean, if you conclude that God is no longer protecting us, then we might as well go back and we might as well say that God's power is not useful anymore. We might as well come to the conclusion that His presence and His provision is not there. He's not protecting us anymore. And no one's going to take that position. But brothers and sisters in Christ, just as God protected people of old, I have to have faith that He's going to protect us today. Listen, we are the hope of the future. Christianity, a righteousness exalts a nation. If this nation is going to be exalted, it's up to you and me living our lives by this good book. I mean, God knows that. We just got to believe it. God has not stopped protecting His people. And just as He protected people of old, He's going to do it for us today. Psalm 98 and verse 1, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done... Oh, isn't that beautiful? Marvelous thing. And isn't He still in the business of doing marvelous things? Wouldn't you agree? Has He done marvelous things in your life? I know He's done marvelous things in my life. But let's say He's, he's made me a new creature, right? Uh, he, he's forgiven me. He's redeemed me. He's reconciled me. He gives me access to prayer. I have all spiritual blessings. And He's got a home in heaven waiting for me right now. Is He still doing marvelous things? You better believe it. And every day He loads our lives with marvelous things, doesn't He? Of course, the process of that, His right hand and His holy arm have gained Him the victory. When you think about the very protection that you and I have in this life, brothers and sisters, don't ever think that it's because of you and me. It is because we have a good and gracious and holy God that is smiling down upon us. And then finally, when I think about the right hand of God, I can't help but think of promises. When God, when you think about the Bible, the Bible is literally filled with promises. That's a message in and of itself, is it not? The promises of God. I mean, there are so many promises in this good book. That's why we should love to read it and look forward to reading it every time we can so that we can draw out those promises and live by them. And when God wants us to know that He is going to keep His promises, guess what He uses? He uses the phrase, the right hand of God. For example, Psalm 110 and verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my, there it is, right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool who is our number one enemy he is none other than satan himself and brothers and sisters in christ i need to believe with all heart that someday he is going to get exactly what is coming to him and what's the confidence in that because of the right hand of god satan can't rise above god he can't oh he'd like to but he can't because of the very fact of the right hand of god he is going to be at our feet. He has no power over you and me. Acts 2 and verse 32 and 33, Jesus God has raised, this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, watch it, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see in here. You think about the promise of the Holy Spirit. The promise. A promise that God said, this is going to happen. The Holy Spirit is going to empower you and the church is going to begin and people are going to be added to it. That all goes back to what? It goes back to the right hand of God. His right hand is a guarantee that He is going to keep His promises. Now that gives me hope. Because in the book of 1 John chapter 2 and verse 21, the Bible says, and this is the promise. And this is the promise that He has promised us, even eternal life. I'm glad that I have the promise of eternal life. Don't you? And it's because of God's right hand that I can lean hard upon that promise. God has promised me eternal life. And He has promised me that by His right hand. There are many other things that we could talk about. But I want you to think about the right hand of God. And the next time you think about that phrase, the next time you're reading through your Bible and you come to the right hand of God, you stop and you reflect upon the position of God. 
You think about the power of God. You think about His presence. Think about His provision, His protection, and the promises that He makes to us over and over again. Now, I want to tell you, folks, I want the right hand of God in my life. Don't you? And if you're not a Christian, it's not there. Oh, God's good to you. And God loves you. But you've got to be one of His own. He takes care of the righteous, as we talked about this morning. Won't you do that? Won't you become a righteous individual? Won't you be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ this very evening? Come believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God. Be baptized for the remission of sins. And you leave here this evening with the right hand of God in your life. And tell others how it got there. You can do that, can't you? We all can. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God and your life is not right. Maybe there are some things that are missing. Maybe you're just struggling and you need the strength and the confidence that God's right hand is still working in your life and you just need the prayers of the church, whatever your need may be. Won't you come now together we stand in that person. message this evening and one thing for that wonderful message this morning it's two good messages we've had today god has really blessed us it's good are there any announcements if not let us not forget tuesday at 10 o'clock let us not forget wednesday at seven o'clock i think that's all our next election will be soon and very soon yeah soon and very soon and after we sing three verses of this then we uh, have our dismissal prayer. Soon and very soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the King. Right there.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for these two great messages that was sent to us by Brother Dayton, by Brother Peyton. Uh, we want a special prayer for Walter Stansel at this time, and the others that are ill and sick also. Be with those that are in foreign fields, and the Middle East, and protect them, Heavenly Father. Forgive us of all our sins, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.